Welcome to the Q Podcast. Q is about conversation. If we're really concerned about ending poverty, we've got to be more concerned about creating justice. Our cultural products as Christians need to both defy and resonate with the culture. But God's doing amazing things. His church is expanding, His church is growing. It's not what's the purpose of my life, it's what is the purpose that's been assigned. Stay curious, think well, advance good. This is Q. Welcome back to another episode of the Q Podcast. I'm Gabe Lyons, and you can follow along with this bigger Q conversation at qideas.org. But every week, we are trying to introduce you to a talk that has taken place at one of our national Q conferences that really informs people around how to think well, be curious, and advance good in culture. And so we talk about a variety of topics here at Q. It's not just talking about the mission of the church, but probably more than that, we're talking about how the church goes forward when it's lived out in all of these different vocations, whether it's a swimsuit designer like our previous episode, or a hip-hop artist, or a business leader, or an athlete, and somebody in the education system. Well, today you're going to actually get to hear from somebody who thinks a lot about media, Uh, We all understand that media is having a huge influence on shaping the narratives of which we start to believe and the way we think and the way we start to engage popular culture. And for Christians, many of us know that lots of times the media seems to be uneducated about faith, uneducated about what's really motivating Christians. And so many times Christian belief is really given just a headline, and it doesn't always represent the way that we really are thinking about something. And so you're going to get to hear from somebody who's invested so many years in helping the media think well about faith. His name is Michael Cromerty. He's the vice president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center, and he helps direct events that actually bring journalists together and help them hear from Christians themselves and different faith leaders, be it Catholic, evangelicals, Protestants, to understand how they're thinking about real issues, how they're thinking about current issues, how they're thinking about politics, so they can actually have a first-hand encounter with somebody who really believes these things. And so it's not just a caricature. His work has helped in so many ways reshape a lens through which so many of our most prominent journalists in American life think about faith and how they report on it now. And so I can't wait for you to just hear how he thinks about it. Pretty entertaining, really funny. Join me in listening to this nine-minute talk by Michael Cromerty on educating the media. I'm the vice president of a think tank in Washington, D.C. called the Ethics and Public Policy Center where I direct the Evangelicals and Studies program and the Faith Angle Forum program. In that capacity, I often get a lot of phone calls from members of the media who ask me some very interesting questions. Uh, For instance, uh, uh, our friends, the Southern Baptists, were having a convention about 16 years ago, and at the convention, they were getting a lot of public uh, attention because they were talking about what they understood to be the proper relationship between men and women in marriage, male headship, female submission, Well, you know, this got a lot of attention in the national news, and I got a phone call from a reporter from the New York Times, and she said, "Uh, you direct the Evangelical Studies program there. Could you help me understand these Southern Baptists? I don't, what what are they talking about? What is this, this whole thing they're talking about men and women? I said, well, first of all, you need to understand that in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 and following, she said, stop right there. What was the name of that book you just mentioned? (laughs) Who's the author? (laughs) Who's the publisher? Well, I realized I needed to start over. I said, well, there's a book called the Bible, and then there's a New Testament, and in that New Testament, there's a letter to the Ephesians written by a man named Paul the Apostle. Another time, I received a phone call from a, and a visit by a very important political writer in Washington at a literary and political magazine, which you would recognize if I told you. He came by my office for an hour. He was very concerned about the rise of the Christian right in American politics. And he said, I want to talk to you about what is an evangelical Christian? What is a fundamentalist Christian? What is a Pentecostal Christian? What is a charismatic Christian? And what in the world are they doing registering to vote by the millions? Let's talk about it. So we did. We talked about all the various nuances of this part of conservative Protestantism. And then I'll never forget, he closed up his pen, he put it in his lap, and he said, let's cut to the real issue. These people are sexually oppressed, aren't they? I said, John, they all have six kids. 
I said, if your problem is monogamy, then we have another discussion. But the best-selling books right now in the evangelical community are on sexuality and marriage. Well, that was not the answer he wanted to hear. But it got me to thinking, what is going on? These are really smart reporters who know a lot about a lot of things. But there's this huge gap of knowledge in their understanding of religious belief and religious believers. And the most famous and the best sociologist of religion in the world today is a man named Peter Berger at Boston University. Peter Berger once made this observation. He said, the most religious country in all the world, qua any kind of religion, is India. The most secular country in the world is Sweden. He said, America is a country of Indians ruled by Swedes. America is a country of Indians ruled by Swedes. And let's face it, a lot of journalists are Swedes. Survey data shows that most journalists are secular. And this is a world and a, a world of discourse that you and I take for granted that they know very little about. And so an idea occurred to me, and I called a major foundation. I said, look, I'd like to put on luncheons for journalists so we can educate them about religion and public life. And the donor said, sure. And so we did that for a couple years, and I went back to the donor, and I said, we're ready to renew our grant. And he said, okay, think bigger. I said, well, we had four lunches last year. How about six? He said, think bigger. I said, eight? And then he said something to me that a donor had never said to me before, and by the way, has never said to me since. <laughs> I hope you heard me. Uh, <laughs> he said to me, think as if money were not an object. What would you do? I was on the phone. I said, I think I need to call you back. <laughs> and so I thought about it, talked to some friends, and I came up with an idea. And I got back in touch with him. And I said, what if we took prominent journalists from New York City and Washington, D.C., and from major news outlets and took them out of those cities to South Beach in Miami, to a very nice venue. Now, you might say, why South Beach? Look, if you want to get important journalists who are really busy to sit still for two days to listen to serious academics, and really, you got to go to a nice place. And you know what he said? Great idea. Let's do it. And so he gave me a very generous grant, and for 14 years, uh, we brought in famous historians, theologians, philosophers, sociologists, political scientists. We've talked about understanding American evangelicalism. We've talked about the varieties of Islam. We've talked about bioethics. We've talked about just war theory. In the run-up to the recent election, we had two sessions on understanding Mormonism, because if we had a president who was a Mormon, we journalists ought to know a little bit about the topic. And so uh, what have we learned? Well, what we've learned is that when you get really smart reporters in the room with some of the best experts and scholars in the world talking about these subjects, something really remarkable occurs, especially if you create an atmosphere of collegiality and civility, and you intentionally work at making the group politically and religiously diverse. This is not a bunch of people getting together all agree. We intentionally make it a diverse group. And it's gone very well. Uh, in fact, some of you may be wondering, how can I get invited to such an event? Well, you first you've got to become a journalist. And then you could do one of two things. You could write a really, really nuanced, thoughtful, perceptive piece on religious people. Our staff would read it and say, now that's a person who gets it. And we want to invite them and encourage them in their work to come to the next Faith Angle Forum. Or you could do another thing. The other thing you could do, and it's oftentimes people say, why did you invite that person? Why did you invite him or her? They're so biased. They don't get it. They intentionally misrepresent us. And my response is, that's why we invite them. They need to be there. And we insist. We try to get people who don't get it to learn how to get it. So what you could do is write a really good story or write a really bad one. Either way, we'll, we'll hear about it and we'll try to invite you. Now, uh, these things, they've gone remarkably well. And we have clear evidence of, of tangible results from columns in the New York Times written by some people whose names you would recognize, uh, articles in the New Yorker magazine, uh, Washington Post, stories at NPR that have been influenced by these forums. And, and of course, I'm delighted about this. I, I, I must tell you, when I first got this grant, I would wake up in the middle of the night and say, what if I invite all these people and nobody wants to come? I, I really thought, but that hasn't been a problem. Uh, the problem has been that, you know, it's, a lot of people want to come. And, and so it's been a wonderful success, and we're grateful for that. But I'm often asked, you know, why do you think it's gone so well, quite apart from the obvious goodness of God's grace, 
Why has it worked? Well, I think the journalists who've been, and, and a couple, there are two of them here who've been at this conference, will tell you that, that they know that we're not pushing an agenda, theologically or politically, but we're actually trying to help them do their job better. We're trying to serve them, to Im give them information that they candidly admit they don't know about. They don't know what a megachurch is. They don't know what the difference between evangelicals and fundamentalists. And so I think the idea that we have actually intentionally tried to serve them, not lecture them, not say, you know, you don't get it, you need to be here, but we want you to be a part of a larger conversation with some of the best scholars in the world on these subjects. And, you know, they come and they say, this has been one of the best experiences in my professional career. And so we're really happy about that. So the lesson is simply this. If you serve others, as Dallas Willard said, if you take on the attitude of servant leadership, they will respect you, they will listen to you, an incredible interaction and conversation will occur, and even more beautifully, friendships will grow out of it. And the conversation doesn't just end at the conference. It's the beginning of a conversation that can, continues throughout the year and throughout the days. So that's what we're trying to do with the Faith Angle Forum. I hope in the next year or two, there'll be some of you that I hear about that are journalists, and you'll be invited to the Faith Angle Forum. Thank you for listening. Michael Cromerty is one of the best. I'm glad you got to meet him and kind of hear how he's thinking about this and the important work that they're doing, and also that you're encouraged. I mean, as we think about the election season, as we think about what's happening in our media right now, how people are represented, how people of faith are talking, how they're speaking and being represented, we're really in a moment where it shapes so much of how Americans think about faith. There's really no substitute for somebody actually meeting a real Christian, actually having a, a legitimate conversation with somebody who can share their own views and use their own words. And so let's not be the kind of people who are quiet or silent or scared to sort of talk about what we believe or why, but just to understand the more we're open about that, the more it actually removes some of these barriers and perception problems and stereotypes that so much of our culture has about Christians. And I hope you'll join us for the next episode of the Q Podcast. Invite your friends to be a part of this with us. Go to qideas.org and you can watch these talks online and enjoy them yourself. And we'll see you back next week. Thank you.